United States, since after all, at least under the Taliban, we had security. And also under the Taliban, we were not occupied by a foreign force. Mm -hmm. And so I think increasingly you're starting to get a wearing down of the Afghan people. Um, and I think the more troops the U.S. sends, the more you'll get a nationalist reaction from the Afghans. That was certainly the experience with the Soviets. Um, and um, my guess is that the function of the troops is less military than it is political, and that the United States is taking a beating in Afghanistan, uh, as it took a beating for an extended period in Iraq. And that's very, there's always a great deal of concern about the, the image of the U.S. As a, as a great power. And the image as a great power means that we have to look like a great power. And if ever the U.S. is perceived as looking weak, that's viewed as the worst possible situation, uh, which will cause others to basically challenge American power. There's always been this tremendous anxiety about U.S. credibility. And so U.S. credibility has been challenged by these, uh, you know, poor unarmed people, basically, um, who don't have modern weapons for the most part. And um, the United States is trying to reassert its credibility uh, by sending in more troops. Obviously, of course, there's a parallel to Vietnam. Um, and I think that basically that's the main issue. And for Obama, there's a personal issue, which is this. American presidents are judged, whether they're good or bad presidents, uh, by the press and to some extent by historians, basically on one, mostly on one factor, I would say, whether or not they increase US power overseas, okay? or where they weaken U.S. power overseas. Good presidents increase it, bad presidents weaken it, all right? And so, um, you know, Obama is very much aware of this, I'm sure, and does not want to go down in history as the one who weakened American power. The fact that he, of course, does not have any military record makes him even more sensitive on that issue. Mm -hmm. I assume he probably is a bit intimidated by the generals with their stars and their fruit salad and all that kind of thing. <laughs> and so I think that's the larger context they here. So I don't think there's really a specific you know, they say there's a specific military strategy, they'll use the troops in this way and that way. And my guess is that's all very secondary. The main function is political, to demonstrate the U.S. is not a defeated country and will not be a defeated country. And Obama will not preside over U.S. defeat. You can decide if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, yes? I, I've just finished reading a book, a really great book, about Pat Tillman, who was a Nazi in the football player uh, that was killed in Afghanistan. And in it, it says bin Laden was by bombing the coal, the USS coal, and uh, other places. And then finally, 9-11, he was trying to provoke the US to invade Afghanistan. That, that was his goal, because that's what destroyed the Soviet Union. Well, he was, um, bin Laden was obsessed with the idea of <coughs> Uh, the defeat of the Soviets, and that, that was a tremendous, that, that almost as if uh, it wasn't, um, it was Islam, the idea of Islam that defeated the Soviet Union, and felt that in the same way he could defeat the United States, of course. Uh, a bit grandiose, obviously, but nevertheless, that was his style. And, um, you know, he's somebody who loves violence and uh, has no compunctions about using it in the most uh, hideous ways. And um, I assume that that would have fitted very nicely with his strategy, the idea of provoking the U.S. in an overreaction. And then in the process of overreacting, the U.S. weakens itself, A, through bankruptcy, uh, and B, through getting uh, its um, military prestige weakened by being um, uh, damaged through counterinsurgency warfare in the same way it was weakened by Vietnam. And so I assume that that, that, that would be very consistent with his overall logic. Militarily and economically. That's right. And, um, you know, as much as we all, I'm sure, despise uh, Bin Laden as a figure, nevertheless, there's something to the logic there that, from his standpoint, um, the, it, it would make sense, obviously, to get the U.S. to overreact mm -hmm. and thereby weaken itself through overreaction. Mm -hmm. uh, something I should add is, as I understand it in Afghanistan, well, of course, in Afghanistan there's another parallel to Vietnam, which is in Vietnam, uh, there was another power that tried to defeat the Viet Cong, or the Vietnamese communists, the French. Uh, they weren't as powerful as the U.S., but they were moderately powerful. They made a real effort. They knew the country much better. And they were defeated, and they warned the United States. This is a very bad place to fight. This is a very tough enemy. You don't want to do the same thing we did. And of course, we disregarded their advice. Uh, but, you know, in Afghanistan, there's another country that had similar experience, and that was the Russians. And they similarly have warned us, and we have similarly disregarded their advice, with one difference. In, in Afghanistan, there are hulks all over the main roads, burnt out Soviet tanks, uh, that every single US soldier uh, you know, from the generals down to the lowliest privates can see, uh, sometimes on a daily basis, to remind them of history, just in case they forgot it. Uh, I'm sure it's an intimidating message. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. In your opinion, is the Rule 42 doctrine still in force? Sure. Sure, absolutely. The Wolfowitz Doctrine was unilateral U.S. leadership, unilateral <coughs> U.S. dominance, through intimidation to a large extent. Um, and uh, the weakening of any potential challenger, including from America's allies. Uh, and I'm sure that's, that's the U.S. objective. I think there's, Europe, I don't think, any longer sees itself as challenging America. I think they've given up on that. I think largely it's Kosovo that caused them to give up on that. Also, once Europe gave up on it, Japan gave up on the idea, too. The Japanese are watching it very closely. And in fact, when Europe launched the Euro, the Vice Minister of Finance was calling up European finance ministers and congratulating them, telling them that, uh, you know, basically you're challenging US, uh, US, US dominance, and uh, we might think of doing that in East Asia as well. But after Kosovo, I think, that um, uh, the Europeans gave up on the idea of challenging the US, and so did the Japanese. And uh, the challengers moved to places like uh, China, Russia, and of course, uh, you know, uh, radical Islam. In some ways, I think that's a pity, because after all, the European. First of all, I think it is indeed a healthy thing to have some multipolarity in the world. That America should not be able to just dictate terms to the rest of the world. That's very unhealthy. It's unhealthy for America. Um, and it's good that there would be some check on American power. And the European Union, at least, was composed of democracies, and I think that would have been a very healthy check on American power. And it's a pity uh, that that project has fallen flat. And I think it was primarily Bosnia and Kosovo that enabled it to do so. But yes, I have a larger question. I, I think that the Wolfowitz Doctrine has become a bipartisan doctrine to a large extent, even if it's not acknowledged as such. And that it's the operative doctrine of the, of the Obama administration. That's at least how I would see it. Yes? Uh, the parallel to Vietnam breaks down because there's no Ho Chi Minh. Uh, and if, if and that or, as an organizing power uh, for the insurgency, if, if there's, if indeed those, the surge, the 30,000 troop surge is primarily political, which I don't believe has been done before, then is there a chance of some success? Well, there's always a chance of success. Uh, these, the wars tend to be unpredictable. And, um, I think the odds of success aren't that high, especially just given history in Afghanistan. Uh, the British, obviously, we know, um, were very unsuccessful. The Russians were unsuccessful. Perhaps the U.S. will succeed where these other two powers failed. Um, and, you know, one's ability to predict these things is extremely limited, I think. Um, so I don't want to say it's impossible that it would succeed. I think it's not likely, but it's not impossible. Um, you know, and, and obviously, of course, the, the parallels are never perfect. Uh, there is no Ho Chi Minh. There's no unity. Uh, no real unity, I would say, among the different groups. And we refer to the Taliban, but the Taliban itself has become rather diffuse, I think. Um, there are also groups like that of Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, who's a warlord, long backed by the CIA, I should add, um, who's now backing the Taliban and has his own agenda. Um, and so there's, there's, there's a very diffuse opposition, I would say, the U.S. faces in Afghanistan. And, um, you know, its ability to outright defeat us, I would say, is, is, is very low. Uh, more likely, I would say, they'll tire us out and cause us to leave, which I think is a more likely scenario. That's, of course, what happened in Vietnam, in fact. Um, and even, uh, even if the United States is ultimately successful in occupying both Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, the cost, not just in terms of lives, but financial, would be colossal. The estimate for Iraq alone was $3 trillion. That's by uh, Joseph Stiglitz of Columbia. Um, I haven't seen reliable figures in terms of the cost of the Afghan war, but it would probably be getting to that figure fairly soon, I think. Afghanistan, by the way, is a tougher place to fight because it's much more rugged geography. It's further distance from the sea, therefore more expensive. And um, um, there's a big question as to whether or not the United States can afford these type of wars at this point, especially when you consider that the US still has a very large current account deficit and the dollar rests on very shaky financial grounds. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think sooner or later the American public is going to have to face the question of um, the way in which these types of imperial adventures are going to affect American living standards. I think David Obey was very courageous in calling for attacks to support the wars to make that connection explicit. Let's at least be honest here. These wars aren't free, you know? And if we want to fight the wars, let's be frank that we'll have to lower our living standards to do so. Um, and so, you know, even if we quote unquote win, it could be in the way that Britain won World War I, where we've won but we're bankrupt at the end. <laughs> I hate to be so uh, down on the house. I want that to myself. You know, isn't the real problem in, in Afghanistan an economic one? Because basically, with 